Hi everyone and welcome to today's lecture where we're going to delve a little more into uh, evolution and history of life starting off with speciation and phylogenies. Um, also you'll hear the term phylogenetic trees a lot today. Now the first thing that we'll cover today as you just saw in the title slide is the concept of speciation. So now when you hear that term, I want you to think, well, what does that mean? Speciation. And it kind of looks like it has the word species hidden within it. So speciation is basically when new species form. And now when we talk about this idea of new species forming, I want you to recall that previously we talked about four evolutionary processes that can really kind of affect allele frequencies and, and populations. So we talked about natural selection, genetic drift, mutation, and gene flow. Now this idea of allele frequencies changing, when you look at the concept of gene flow, if for instance a barrier suddenly arises, well, now you have populations that are isolated from each other. And eventually those isolated populations can end up diverging quite a bit, meaning separating from each other in terms of their structures, their genetics, who they really are, okay? And so eventually what you get with that isolation is the idea of speciation where you basically have this splitting event where you end up with two or more distinct species from a single ancestral species, okay? And this can happen very quickly or it could take millions and millions of years, okay? Depending on the organism. Now, when we talk about speciation, okay, the easy, you know, definition of it can just be thinking speciation is when new species form. Okay, populations have become isolated from each other. Now, when we say the term species, you have to ask, well, how do they actually define what these species are? You know, what makes them categorized as new or separate species from what they were before? And so the way that they define species is based on three different concepts that we're going to talk about. You can define species through the biological concept. You can define species through the morphospecies concept, or you can define species through the phylogenetic species concept. And we're going to talk about all of that in a minute. Each one will get their due time. But the last point that I want to make before we discuss those different concepts is the idea of speciation. If you're creating new species, how does this affect biodiversity and, you know, overall populations and, and communities or ecosystems? Well, if you picture speciation, speciation creating new species, new forms of organisms with new structures, new genes, new abilities sometimes, well then you are increasing biodiversity. Because if you break down that term biodiversity, it's the diversity of living organisms. So more species with more abilities, genes, all of that fun stuff means increased more biodiversity, which is a fancy way of saying more variety of life. So now we're going to go through each of those species concepts of how species can be defined. Now, when you're using the biological species concept, the main criteria for defining or separating the various, various species, you know, what makes a new species, is the criteria of reproductive isolation. And reproductive isolation is just a fancy way of saying that those two organisms cannot successfully interbreed, okay? Meaning the, the populations are not capable of mating 
or they're not capable of producing viable offspring. Now that brings us to the next terminology that I want you to know, which is the difference between prezygotic and postzygotic reproductive isolation. Now to determine what they mean, just look at the first part of each word, pre and post. Pre means before a zygote is formed, post means after a zygote would be formed. Now that means that the difference between the two, prezygotic is isolation that is before mating, which means that prezygotic isolation means that the populations are not able to mate. They are in some way blocked from being able to breed with each other. Whereas postzygotic isolation means that yes, the populations will breed or will mate with each other, but if they do, they will not be able to produce offspring that can survive, or they will not be able to produce offspring that can reproduce, meaning their offspring would be uh, sterile. Okay, so prezygotic reproductive isolation means the organisms cannot even get to mate. Postzygotic means they mate, but they do not produce viable fertile offspring. Okay, now we're going to go through some of these examples of prezygotic and postzygotic isolation. Prezygotic isolation examples are all listed out here in this figure. Temporal habitat, behavioral, gametic, and mechanical, okay? And so what each of these means, okay? When I say know the examples, I don't mean these exact examples on the right. I mean these terms here. That temporal isolation is an example of prezygotic isolation. That habitat, behavioral, gametic, or uh, mechanical are all examples of prezygotic looking at them, temporal always means time. So for instance, if you know certain organisms have mating seasons, well, they're not always going to have their mating seasons at the same time. So if they're at two different times capable of mating, then they're not going to mate with each other. So they'll be considered two different species. Habitat means that the populations or those organisms mate or breed within different habitats. So for instance, let's say one can only mate in trees, whereas the other mates out in the ocean. Well, are they ever going to mate with each other? No. Okay, they have to be in the same place to, to mate. Okay, there's no sexing out in the wild that doesn't count. To mate, they have to be together. Behavioral is another form of prezygotic isolation, basically meaning that certain behaviors that differ between the organisms prevent them from being able to mate with each other. Okay, their courtship may not be compatible. So that would make them different species if they can't attract the, the opposite um, organism. Okay, then interestingly enough, some actually have a gametic barrier, okay? So meaning that there are certain organisms, if organism A has sperm that cannot penetrate the egg of organism B, then they are considered two different species because they cannot mate with each other. The sperm cannot enter the egg, they can't end up mating, okay? The last one, I love that picture so much, is mechanical uh, mechanical isolation, okay, mechanical barriers. And without getting too crude with this, um, what this simply means, mechanical always means physical. So basically, sometimes the male uh, organism doesn't quite fit the female organism. So in the case they have here is different dog breeds. The idea that sometimes it would basically, you know, kill or wreck that female organism if they tried to mate, okay? Like pushing a watermelon through a pinhole, right? If you've ever heard that one. So 
they physically cannot mate with each other. So all of those would be examples of how you then have to classify those organisms as two different species because they cannot mate with each other, whether it's temporal, habitat barriers, behavioral barriers, their gametes, or just physical incompatibility. These populations are no longer capable of reproducing together, of mating together. And it's prezygotic because they can't even get to the dirty deed, okay? They cannot get to the mating event itself, okay? Next, we'll go into the examples of postzygotic isolation. Now, there were a whole bunch of prezygotic isolation examples. There are only two postzygotic isolation examples we have here. There's hybrid vi viability and hybrid sterility. Now, I know on the previous slide I said you wouldn't have to know any of the examples listed here, but on this slide, I want you to circle star highlight this example here. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. I want you to know that example there the horses, donkeys, mule example. We'll talk about that in one minute, but I want to make sure to tell you to circle, star, highlight that. Now, when we talk about postzygotic, remember this is isolation occurring after the organisms have mated. So they've done the dirty deed, but they are not considered species because either when they try to um, reproduce, the offspring are inviable, so that's hybrid viability isolation. Their offspring of this mating between these two organisms will not survive, okay? It will either develop deformed or it will just die as embryos, okay? So basically miscarry each time, okay? And that's why they are now considered different species because when they mate, even though they do mate, they do not produce viable offspring, okay? Hybrid meaning when you put the two organisms together. So when those two organisms mate, they are postzygotically isolated because their, their hybrid offspring are inviable. Now there's also hybrid sterility. So sometimes we categorize two organisms or two populations as different species because even though they mate and produce offspring, their offspring are sterile, okay? So their offspring cannot reproduce. Okay, so we don't consider those two organisms that produce sterile offspring to be the same species, okay? Because if they're the same species, they should be able to produce healthy, viable, fertile offspring. Now, the example of this that I do want you to remember is the idea that horses and donkeys are different species because even though they can mate, meaning, you know, they, they end up in the same habitat, they have the same time that they, they mate, you know, we're not breaking any of those previous prezygotic issues, okay? They're physically capable, okay? Their reproductive organs can fit together. They, um, the, the gametes can fit together, but what they produce is a mule that is sterile, okay? So mules can then not have offspring on their own. The only way you can create mules is by mating the horse and the donkey together, okay? You can't get mules from other mules. So I want you to remember that example that horses and donkeys are different species and that they produce mules that are sterile. And if I ask you, where do you get mules from? It's from horse and donkey uh, mixed together and it's an example of a sterile offspring hybrid, okay? so please circle star highlight this example here. Okay, 
So now before we move on to other topics, I just want to kind of have a slide that shows you the prezygotic isolation and the postzygotic isolation together. And you can use this slide to help you practice, you know, testing yourself or preparing for exams later on, because I could ask you various questions such as temporal isolation is an example of which of the following? Well, it's an example of prezygotic isolation. And I could list various other terms. I could say, you know, which of the temporal isolation is an example of which of the following prezygotic isolation, postzygotic isolation, hybrid viability, or gametic barrier, something like that. And you would pick prezygotic isolation. I could also ask you questions like we mentioned in the previous slide, the idea of that horses and donkeys example. So I can say, um, which of the following is true? Horses and donkeys are the same species because they can mate together. Horses and donkeys are different species because of hybrid sterility. Horses and donkeys can mate with mules and produce viable offspring. Uh, horses and donkeys have a gametic barrier. Okay, and you would have to pick which of those is true. Okay, based on what we talked about in the previous slide. I can ask about mules, for instance, as well. Okay, mules are an example of which type of isolation? Well, they're an example of postzygotic isolation, specifically hybrid sterility. Okay, so kind of make sure you know each of these terms is an example of prezygotic, each of these terms is an example of postzygotic. Know this example over here, horses, donkeys, and mules. And please know what prezygotic and postzygotic actually mean. Okay, so the idea of the species can't get a chance to physically mate, or can they mate but then have problems in terms of the offspring? Okay, if you have any questions, just send me a message in the Remind app. So now that you're experts on the biological species concept, uh, we have to ask ourselves, what are the key features that really distinguish each of the different concepts? And, and how do the other two concepts, morphospecies and phylogenetic species, differ from the one we've talked about so far, which is biological species? So when you hear biological species concept, that one here and here, it's all about reproductive success. Can the organisms mate together and can they produce viable, fertile offspring? Morphospecies, on the other hand, I like this little figure for it, that basically organizes uh, new or different species based on their differences in appearance, in their structural differences, so things like size, shape, and any other morphological features. Basically, you know, if an organism has a distinguishing feature, that's what makes it a separate species in the morphospecies concept. Then you have the phylogenetic species concept. Okay, so phylogenetic species over here, you can see it looks like a phylogenetic tree. This one basically identifies or separates species based on their evolutionary history. Okay, so the, the idea of what's called monophyletic groups or clade or lineage, which we will talk about in, in future slides as well. Okay, so basically that's the one that will look at ancestral populations and descendants to distinguish the, the species, and it will look at common, common ancestry. So when we think about the key features to distinguish each of the concepts, I can basically, you know, if I ask questions about which concept are, are we looking at, if you hear reproductive success, as a key feature, then that tells you you're looking at the biological species concept. If you hear any physical appearances, things like size, shape, color, as you can see here in the figure, that means we're talking about morphospecies. And if you hear the
term common ancestor or common ancestry and evolutionary uh, distinguishing, that would be phylogenetic species concept. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with the key features that we're looking at in each concept. Now, as we think about ways that new species can, you know, diverge or, or separate into those new species, uh, there's still a lot more terminology that you need to know to kind of visualize how these things happen. Now, one of the terms to know is allopatry, okay, right here. And the definition I wrote out here is when populations physically get separated. So allopatric speciation is when you end up with new species uh, in the different locations once the populations have been geographically separated. So this figure here shows you first have a geography, a location that is all one with organisms all mixed together as one species. And then when they become geographically separated, gradually with time, the two populations end up diverging and end up having their own characteristics that ultimately lead them to be separate, distinct species. Now, allopatric speciation can include either dispersal or vicariance, and we're going to look at figures of each of these in the next slide to help you visualize it. But for now, picture it as dispersal would be, for instance, birds flying away from one location and settling in a new location. And then over time, they're going to become a new species because they are now separated from the original population. So each will go down their own new pathway. So it's the movement of organisms from one location to a new location, causing speciation, causing two different species now. Vicariance, on the other hand, is like you see in this picture here, the idea where a physical geographic barrier has formed, such as a mountain or a river. There's some sort of physical geographic barrier separating the population so that they div diverge into separate pathways, new species, because they've been isolated from each other. Okay, again, we're going to go through that in the next slide as well so you can visualize it. Any of those events of speciation happening from that kind of geographic isolation from populations being in two different locations now, that allopatric speciation is different from sympatric speciation, which you see on the bottom part of this figure here where you have two species emerging, you know, down separate paths, despite physically living in the same area. Okay, so if I say that new species formed while living in the same forest, the same location, that would be sympatric speciation. If I said that two species formed when they became geographically isolated, that would be allopatric speciation. And I can specify either geographically isolated, one, move, one set of the population moved to uh, the new location, or a physical barrier came between them. And that you would then distinguish between dispersal and vicariance. Okay, so again, we're gonna look at that right now on the next slide. So just a reminder, when you are looking at allopatric speciation, so geographic isolation, meaning a new habitat, you notice if some individuals of that population are moving to the second geographic location, that is dispersal. They've dispersed themselves into that new location now that they are separate from the original population, divergence starts to occur because things like mutation and selection that we talked about previously happen on that population. 
So eventually they become their own new species because they can no longer, let's say, mate or produce viable offspring with the original population. But again, the key here is the movement of individuals, that's dispersal. Here in the second figure, if it is a chance event, a physical separation of the geography, such as a river, a mountain, uh, a piece of land breaking off, okay, that is vicariance. So circle star highlight these two terms. If I explain something happening to a population, you should be able to tell me, is it allopatric or sympatric? Is it dispersal or vicariance? Okay, things like that. So now let's focus on speciation that occurs in the sympatric way, meaning that you get new species, even though the individuals or the populations were living in the same location, which you see here. Originally, you had one big population, and then all of a sudden, you end up with this new species forming within that location, okay? So sympatric speciation means there is no geographic barrier, okay? Make sure you circle star, highlight that point. Sympatric speciation means there is no geographic barrier, okay? The populations are all together in one location. So how can this happen? Well, it can either happen from external events, meaning outside of the individuals, or internal events, meaning happening, for instance, at the gene level within the individuals, in their little bodies, okay? So what are some examples of each? Well, external events that can lead to uh, sympatric speciation are things like disruptive selection. And this figure here, you can write that this figure shows disruptive selection, meaning originally in this population, you had a variety of different phenotypes. So different colors of the same species uh, because they're different, they're, they're different phenotypes the expression of their genes cause all of these different colors. But then what can happen in disruptive selection for one reason or another, certain extreme phenotypes end up selected for. So let's say all of a sudden, this guy in the middle uh, becomes the ideal prey, uh, prey for a particular predator in that location and they get all gobbled up. Well, then that means that the other guys, these colors, the, the much darker or the much brighter ones, they will end up reproducing in more robust amounts. They'll become more common and eventually they can end up as their own species. OK, even though they're originally within the same population. Okay, because there's been this selection that caused them to kind of take on this new role, this new niche in that environment, that they can end up on a pathway to becoming different from each other. Okay, the internal events that can lead to sympatric speciation, meaning within the organism it's happening, that's usually chromosomal mutations. Okay, so things like genes having their mutations and now suddenly, especially with time accumulating a lot of these mutations, some of those individuals may end up drastically different from the original population and different enough that they can be categorized as a new species. So now we're gonna go into another way that new species can be created, which is speciation by polyploidization, okay? No, it's a mouthful, but it brings us back to one of my favorite topics, genetics. So when you see polyploid, polyploidy over here, what that simply means is that an organism or an individual has more than two complete sets of chromosomes, okay? Because a, a major error either happened in meiosis or mitosis. Now, remember, when we think of an individual, you're supposed to have two sets of chromosomes. Why? Where did they come from? One from mom, one from dad. That then makes you diploid, okay? Two sets of chromosomes. If you were to have more than that, 
Okay, if mutation led you to have more than that, or if something happened and you had more than that, you would be called polyploid, okay? Many extra chromosomes. Now, you usually see this more in plants rather than animals, so if you haven't really heard the term before, you just may not have really studied uh, anything with plants yet. Now, there are two uh, main forms of polyploidy that we talk about. There's autopolyploidy and allopolyploidy, okay? And I want you to underline the L-O in allopolyploidy, okay? We're going to talk about why you did that in a minute. Now, auto, when you hear auto, that means self, right? So just a single individual. Autopolyploidy is basically when a polyploid individual is created because a mutation occurred, usually in meiosis. And that mutation occurring resulted in double the amount of chromosomes that that individual was supposed to have. But note that all of those chromosomes, those extra chromosomes they have, are all coming from the same species, okay, from self. You can think of that. It has. Allopolyploidy, on the other hand, the reason I had you underline the LO is I want you to think created from love because these individuals are polyploid because they were created when two parents mated that were different species, okay? And normally that's not supposed to usually create viable non-sterile offspring, but basically sometimes an error can occur usually in like mitosis, you don't have to worry about that, but in this case, an error occurred where two parents of different species mated and ended up producing a viable non-sterile offspring that has both full sets of chromosomes, okay? So that's why I said that one, think love, because it's made from, um, organisms mating together. And then ultimately what happens, which you see in this figure, okay, once you end up with that polyploid individual, sometimes tetraploid, meaning four sets of chromosomes instead of diploid, which is your usual two sets, okay, then they are a different species from the original parent diploid or original self versions, the diploid version with two sets of chromosomes because they cannot produce viable uh, gametes and, and viable offspring. Now I know anything related to genetics is a mouthful or um, basically students don't like it as much. So I made a recap slide for you to pause and jot down the significant significant points of the previous slide. Now that we've talked about all of these various ways that you can end up with a new species, you know, they completely diverge from the original organisms and now they're their very own species, they're their own population. Well, something to consider is what happens if these new species that emerge, especially because they were isolated from other species, what happens if they come in contact again with the original population that they came from, that they, that they diverged separately from? Okay, so we're not going to go into crazy details about what happens for each, but I just want you to know that this side here, all of these terms here, are simply examples of possible outcomes if suddenly that new species comes into contact again or, or is mixed together with the original population that it, it branched off from. Okay? One option is fusion of the populations, and that's only if the two species have not fully diverged and, you know, basically the, any distinctions between them can still be reversed through gene flow at this point, okay? So you end up with the two populations freely interbreeding, and eventually you can even head back toward, you know, what the original population was, okay? But again, that can only happen if the new species is not so far 
different and diverge from the original one. Otherwise, as you know, they won't be able to successfully reproduce, okay? You can also have reinforcement. I want you to circle, star, highlight the term reinforcement. This is a term I want you to know. Reinforcement means that a new species and the original species have now become so diverged or separate that even if they come in contact again, okay, they are prevented from breeding together. Okay, so reinforcement is when the new species and its original population are so far diverged, so different, that they are prevented from interbreeding, okay? Sometimes you end up with a hybrid zone formation, okay, an extra little kind of cross area where they will, will be able to interact and, um, and, and maintain stability, but again, you're not having the complete separation or the complete blending at this point. It's just a mixing zone. Another option is that one of the populations ends up completely extinct because as you know, sometimes one location, one area is a niche specific to certain traits to survive. So what might happen if the two species come in contact again, maybe those new structures that, that emerged aren't actually as good in the, the original location. Or maybe the opposite, maybe the original population is not as good at getting the resources, okay? Getting the food, getting the nutrients, getting the water, okay? So they end up dying out. So one or the other population may end up extinct when they're both back together in the same area. And then, of course, anytime you have mixture of, of various species and you have habitats constantly changing, there is the, pop the, the possibility of forming new species. Okay, so again, we're not going to go into crazy detail of all of these. I just want you to know that each of these is an example of possible outcomes when isolated species meet back up. And I want you to know the term reinforcement. Okay, they are, they're two different now. The divergence or the separation is reinforced. They can't breed together. So now that you're all experts at species and speciation, let's kind of move a little bit forward and get into the phylogenetics part of this lesson or phylogeny part, okay, in which we can study these species and their various histories throughout time. A very important tool for studying the history of these species is the concept of phylogenetic trees. Now, normally they would look very much like this one, but this is, of course, me being me. This is a meme version of uh, phylogeny. So instead of species, you're going to see uh, March Madness sports uh, names along here. So now, when we say phylogenies and then phylogenetic trees, anytime you hear the term phylogeny, I want you to think of this definition here. It's simply the evolutionary history of a group of organisms, okay? So basically looking at different species and seeing how they have changed throughout time, who were their um, most recent ancestors, who were their shared common ancestors even way back when. Now, in order to study phylogenies, we use the phylogenetic trees. And in a minute, we're gonna go through more and more details of these phylogenetic trees, but ultimately just know for now that they are graphical representations of the phylogenies, okay? So for this slide, that's all you have to know, but then in the coming slides, you're gonna have to know all the terminology associated with them and what these phylogenetic trees can actually tell you in terms of species and the history of organisms. Okay, okay, so now we get 
to the specifics of phylogenetic trees. And these are all the terms that I want you to know associated with the parts of a phylogenetic tree. So this is the phylogenetic tree over here. And here are the definitions. Now, the first term is a branch. So any of these lines that you see going left to right, these are branches of the phylogenetic tree. Okay, and I want you to note that anything over here, this will be the most recent time point. Okay, these are derived from the ancestors back here. Okay, so anything back toward the left is an ancestor. Anything toward the right is what derived from those ancestors later on, aka more recently. Okay. <clears throat> with each root, you and sorry, with each branch, you eventually get to roots. The root is over here. Okay, just like any tree. Okay, so you have all the branches, and then you lead to the root, and that is the most ancestral branch in the tree. Okay, so that will have the furthest back common ancestor of anything that eventually leads forward. Okay, that's this is the side that you would find the ancestors. Then you have tips. Okay, tips are each point that then has a species name or an individual's name. Okay, they're the end point of branches, as you can see, and they represent the organisms that that, you know, derived from the, the previous ancestors. And please note that these derived organisms, not all of them will be currently living, okay? Sometimes you'll have extinct groups or species on a phylogenetic tree as a tip, simply because you're showing that they derived from even earlier um, ancestors, okay? So don't assume that just because you see a tip as a particular species, it doesn't mean that that's living or, ex or, you know, still around. And usually when it comes to them being extinct, a lot of times the, the person making the tree will actually write the word like in parentheses, um, you know, ex extinct so that you know. You also have an out group, okay, on a, on a lot of phylogenetic branches. You see the outgroup here are the Arctic graylings. This outgroup is basically a, a species or taxa or group that diverged from the, you know, way back common ancestor, okay, that's, you know, prior or earlier to the ones that you're actually studying. Kind of think of it as a reference point, you know, to to kind of compare or to really see you know a difference between your focus and the out group you also have nodes and nodes are very important they are these gray circles that you see all throughout this this tree a node is a fork where branches meet okay so you could look at them as branches meeting or where the branches ended up splitting off in history. And that represents a common ancestor shared between those branches where it split. Okay, so this, this gray circle, which is now the red, the red dot of my pointer, this node would be a common ancestor between pink salmon and sockeye salmon. Then this node would represent the most recent common ancestor of all four of these organisms. So not just pink salmon and sockeye, but also of king salmon and coho. Okay, so every node represents a common ancestor uh, of all of the groups that come after it. Okay. Now, normally those nodes, those common ancestors, branch into two branches at a time. So you see that even though this common ancestor is shared all throughout these, it in, in the visual represented it, representation, it first branched into two branches. 
you ever see a common ancestor and suddenly there's more than two branches, okay, like this guy here, that is a polytomy, okay? So a node with a common ancestor where instead of the tree branching or splitting into two at that point, it's split into three. And as it says here, there's usually the, the idea of insufficient data available in terms of really, you know, writing down or being able to distinguish who the, the most closely related to are. Okay, so polytomies are simply nodes where the common ancestor branches beyond just two, um, two, two branches. Okay, if you have any issue with any of the terminology, you're not sure what any of the terms mean, or you want me to go further over it, just let me know, because I want you to know each of these terms and how it relates to the, the phylogenetic tree graphic, okay? Now, when it comes to phylogenetic trees, I want you to keep in mind that you're not always going to see the whole picture, okay? Different people studying, you know, various organisms or various locations and the history of the organisms there, they will, you know, put the information that they might think is pertinent. So you're not always going to see everything. So I just put a couple of important tips on this slide about phylogenetic trees. You, the first one is that just because you see two of the words close to each other, for instance here, Atlantic and pink salmon, okay? Just because you see them close to each other, that does not tell you anything about the relationship between them, okay? You can write this, this tree in any order that you want as long as the branches themselves are organized in the proper manner, okay? So if you were just looking at the names and not the branches, that would tell you nothing. You have to look at the actual structure, okay? The other thing is that the number of branches that you're seeing and the number of nodes that you're seeing does not tell you anything because like I said, you know, people sometimes they leave out certain aspects of a tree because the tree is supposed to be on whatever you're focused on studying. So, you know, they might not have every huge picture of that particular, you know, habitat that they're studying of that particular, um, organism family. So don't go based on the number of nodes, number of branches you're seeing. Look at how they're all connected to each other. That's what gives you the information, okay? And for instance, just seeing these two here, that doesn't tell you the full story because there are other organisms that you can then add on to the phylogenetic tree. Okay, so number of nodes does not tell you the full story on a tree and the location of the words um, next to each other does not tell you the story. You have to look at the actual connections of the branches and, and what they're trying to say. So now how exactly do biologists come up with these phylogenetic trees and these phylogenies the answer is through using a data matrix, okay? This here is an example of a data matrix. So it will line up the different organisms, the taxa, the species that you're looking at, and then it will line up various characteristics or traits. And it will show if you see a one, it means that that group, that organism has that trait. If you see a zero, it does not have that trait. Okay, so looking at a data matrix, you can see that a lungfish has a skull, but it doesn't have limbs, hair, or lactation because those are all zero for the lungfish. Then you look at the lizard and what do you notice? He has one and one, so he's got a skull and limbs, but zero, so no hair, no lactation. Okay, and then looking at this data matrix, what do you see? These two species or organisms or taxa, whatever you're using, 
these two share all of those characters. So those two, the dog and human, their branches would be um, connected together with a common ancestor, okay? Now notice on the previous slide we mentioned an outgroup and you see an outgroup here again. This lungfish is the outgroup. It's a sister group that shares a common ancestor over here with all of the other taxa being studied, but it's not the focus of the study. Instead, the focus of this study is over here. Now, another important aspect of phylogenetic trees that I want you to be able to do, for instance, on an exam, is to be able to look at that phylogenetic tree and be able to determine which taxa or which organisms would have certain characteristics or traits. And the way you do that is when you see a characteristic or a trait on the tree, for instance, limbs here, that tells you that any of the organisms that branched out from there have that trait. Any of the organisms that their branches come from behind that, so for instance, over here, do not have that trait. Okay, so let's look at the first set here. Hair and lactation. You find both of these traits or characteristics over here. So if I were to ask you which of these four organisms have hair, you would find hair, the trait here, and you would follow it. What branches have hair? Dogs and humans. Which ones do not? Any of the ones that are be behind it, okay? So any of the ones that branch from behind it, such as lizards and lungfish, okay? They're not in front of it, they're behind it, okay? So if, for instance, I said, which of the following four organisms lacks limbs by looking at this phylogenetic tree? Well, you would look, limbs, who has it? Follow the branch forward. Who emerged or diverged with limbs? Lizards, dogs, and humans, okay? What branches are not emerged or diverged from limbs, not connected to it? Well, you would go backwards, that's the lungfish. Okay, so I can show you a picture like this on an exam, and I could ask you about, you know, who, who shares a common, the, the most uh, recent common ancestor, which are nodes that we talked about in the previous slides, or I can say, you know, who has a certain trait, who does not have a certain trait, okay? And if I asked about the skull, well, would you notice they all have the skull, okay? All of the branches come after the skull trait emerged in history for these, these organisms, okay? So that's the main way that you would read the phylogenetic trees and the traits associated with them. Don't worry about this word yet. We're going to talk about that in a couple of slides. So now in previous slides, you may have, you know, noticed that I kept using terms like ancestor and derived in terms of traits and the phylogenetic tree. So the difference between the two is that ancestral traits are any kind of traits that were present in a common ancestor that you're looking at. So for instance, if we're looking at this most recent common ancestor here, well, some, anything before it, such as this skull trait, was already present in this common ancestor. Any traits that then occurred after that common ancestor, so they developed later on, like limbs or hair and lactation, these are derived traits, okay? So derived traits are any of the traits that were not present in a common ancestor. So ancestral traits were present in the common ancestor, derived traits were not. Now, how can you identify which is which on a phylogenetic tree? Well, we just did that. So if you're looking at the common ancestor, ancestral traits will occur before that node, okay? Before that common ancestor, derived traits will occur after, okay? After that node. Okay. Now it can vary depending on which ancestor, common ancestor you're looking at. Let's say your focus was over here and you're looking at this common ancestor. Well then limbs would be an ancestral trait 
that were already present in this common ancestor over here, whereas hair and lactation came after that. Okay, so again, look at where the pointer is right here, right over here. Before it, ancestral traits, after it, derived traits. So I can put, let's say on a test, if I had the picture of this chart, I can put a little arrow or star pointing out which common ancestor we're looking at and asking which traits would be ancestral, which would be derived. Okay, and you don't even need a picture. I can even, you know, use the words to explain if a trait occurs before the node or after the node. And again, you should know that term from the previous slides. The node is the common ancestor uh, graphical representation. Okay. The last point that I want to make on this slide is the concept of synapomorphies. Okay, so you see that term here pointing over here. Uh, synapomorphy is basically a trait that's found in two or more taxa that's present in their most common, you know, the sorry, most recent common ancestor, but is missing in the distant ancestors. Okay, so for instance, you notice these are listed as synapomorphies because they're found in the most recent common ancestor of dogs and humans, okay, right right here, okay? Remember how to read the, the graph. You have the tip of the branches are the organisms you're looking at in your focus. The node over here is the common ancestor. And then right in front of that, that's an ancestral, that, that would be um, a trait that the common ancestor has, okay? But you notice these traits that this most recent common ancestor has is not shared by all of the previous uh, common ancestors, okay? So for instance, this ancestor here did not have hair and lactation that came later on, okay? This ancestor here did not have hair and lactation. What did it have? Only the skull. This ancestor here had the skull and the limbs in front of it, okay? So remember, you have the traits that come before your branches, okay? The ones that come after your branches, they developed later on, okay? So synapomorphies, again, are traits that are found in the most recent common ancestor, but missing in the more distant ancestors. And that's important because then you can study things like the loss of ancestral characteristics, like the loss of limbs in, in snakes, for instance. Okay, so it helps you study the history and the development of various traits. Now, I just want to point out that synapomorphies can vary depending on which organisms you're looking at. So previously, and, and even in this figure, they list synapomorphies as hair and lactation, but that's if you're looking at dogs versus humans. If your focus is this part of the tree here, well then, what's the most, com most recent common ancestor when you're looking at this part? It's the node over here instead. Okay, so instead of being the node here, when you're looking at all three of these to compare, you're now looking at this common ancestor. So now the synapomorphy would be limbs, okay, because limbs are present in this most common ancestor, but not in the previous, more distant, in the past ancestors, okay? It's no longer hair and lactation if you're looking at these because this common ancestor does not have hair or lactation. That was a derived trait later on. Okay, so always follow where you're looking at, circle the exact point that you are looking at in comparison, and be careful. Again, don't just memorize, oh, hair and lactation are the synapomorphies. No, that's only if you're looking at dogs and humans. If I gave you a question where the common ancestor we're looking at is over here for all three of these, then it would be very different answer.
Now, we just said that synapomorphies are present in the most recent common ancestor, but missing from all the, the, the far more distant ancestors. That differs from autopomorphies because an autopomorphy is a trait that's only present in a single taxa. And instead of saying taxa, which is the evolutionary biologist term, you can say a single organism or a single species. So for instance, if we're looking at this example again here, synapomorphy would be hair and lactation that human and dog's most recent ancestor had, but the previous ones did not. An autopomorphy would be using words for speech to humans, okay? Dogs may be able to bark and have any other kind of form of communication, but unless you're watching the movie up, you're not going to hear them speaking actual human words, okay? So the example that I want you to write in humans is speech with words. That's specific to humans. Now, even though it's important to know autopomorphies, what really helps us when we are studying the history of various organisms and, and the history of life, synapomorphies are very important to us because they help us recognize what we call monophyletic groups. And when I ask what are the alternate terms for that, the answer is clades or lineages. Now it's okay if you don't know how to write that, I'm going to put a recap on the next slide so that you know how to properly spell those. But just know when you hear clade or lineage, that's the same thing as saying monophyletic group. Now what exactly is a monophyletic group? It's basically an evolutionary unit that includes an ancestral population, and all of its descendants, but no others, okay? So for instance, this piece of the, the phylogenetic tree here, highlighted in that orangey red kind of color, that would be a monophyletic group. And it's characterized by the presence of the synapomorphy over here. Okay, so shared, a, you know, the shared derived trait present in all of these guys, but not the ones that came before it, okay? Now, for instance, when we picture the example that we kept using in the previous slides, where we had humans, dogs, and lizards over here, um, for instance, that would be a monophyletic group defined by their shared derived trait of having limbs, okay? But then again, even though we can say that lizards, dogs, and humans from the, the previous graph uh, or figure that we saw are a monophyletic group for sharing limbs, you can have more than one different monophyletic group. So for instance, dogs and humans can be recognized as their own different monophyletic group based on their shared derived traits of hair and lactation. Okay, so basically the logic that I'm trying to get at is that you can have smaller monophyletic groups nested within larger ones. So for instance, this here can be one monophyletic group. Then this here can be a second monophyletic group, a third monophyletic group, okay? So it depends on what shared trait you're looking at, what synapomorphy you're you know, focused on, can tell you which monophyletic group you're looking at. Now, sometimes you also see the terms polyphyletic or paraphyletic groups. So I want you to be able to look at this picture and figure out, are we talking about a monophyletic group, which would be what this looks like, or polyphyletic is shown here. So I want you to write the word polyphyletic right next to this guy over here, okay? So polyphyletic is when there are groups that do not include the most recent ancestor. Okay, so you'll see branches highlighted, but not the whole area with the common ancestor. So polyphyletic, you'll see separate branches highlighted, 
but not including the most recent common ancestor. Okay, so this common ancestor notice is not highlighted. That's polyphyletic. The last one is paraphyletic. So make sure you write next to this one, paraphyletic. The way to recognize and identify paraphyletic because that's a group that includes the ancestor and most descendants, but not all descendants. The way you identify paraphyletic is that look, one of the tips of one of the branches will be missing from that group. Okay, it will not be included. So for instance, in this example, there was the loss of a trait. So suddenly this species over here is not part of the group. Okay, I know, sad, uh, but yeah, he's all left out and that makes it paraphyletic. So if everyone is included in that group, it's monophyletic. If the common ancestor is not included, it is now polyphyletic. And if the later descendant, if, if a random descendant is left out, then it's paraphyletic, okay? So everyone included, then the second one is missing or not including the common ancestor, and the last one is not including a descendant, okay? So it includes most of the descendants, but not all. Okay, so make sure you're clear on the differences because I could ask that in various ways as you just saw. Okay, that was a whole lot in the past few slides and I know there was a lot of terminology specific to biology and evolution. So I jotted down some recap notes for you just to make sure that you have things like spelling of, of the terms correct in your notes. So you can pause here, write down all of the notes on this slide as an extra little recap of key terms. Now there's another thing I want to point out about phylogenetic trees. You know, we've been looking at all of these different pictures and sometimes, you know, students will look at a picture and think, oh, this line is longer than this line, so that means something. Well, sometimes it does if there's a specific graphical key. If there's a key like you see here or here, then branch length means something. If you do not see any graph key, meaning here or here, if instead you just see the phylogenetic tree and no, no, no extra little key, that means the branch length means nothing. It's arbitrary. Okay, so always look to see if there is an extra key present on or near the tree. So you can call it a key or a legend, okay? A key or a legend, if you see that, then it will tell you, oh, the length represents the number of base substitutions, or the length represents the number of millions of years ago that an ancestor was around, okay? If you do not see that, for instance, this first one, you would not be able to determine anything about the evolutionary time between ancestors, okay? You wouldn't know, well, was it four million years or two million years? No, only if there's a legend or a key. So please make sure to write that in your notes and circle heart star, highlight the fact that if you do not see any key or legend, it means that the varying lengths of branches do not represent anything. They mean nothing, they're arbitrary, they tell you nothing, okay? All that they can tell you is the, the way they're connected to other branches, okay? But the length would mean nothing if there is no legend or key. Okay, so now there's some more terms that I want you to know associated with phylogenetic trees and the history of, of life. Two big terms are homology and homoplasy, and a lot of students get them mixed up what they mean. So when you see that prefix homo, that means same, okay? So both of these are dealing with traits that are the same between organisms. But the difference is, is that in homology, homology occurs when the traits are similar due to shared ancestry, okay, due to having this, the same common ancestor 
with those traits. Homoplasy, on the other hand, that occurs when traits are similar, but for reasons other than common ancestry. Okay, so they, they, they are not the same structure or the same look due to a common ancestor. Instead, it's something different. Okay, and that something different a lot of times is convergent evolution. So for how does convergent evolution relate to this? Well, that convergent evolution is a common cause of homoplasy. Okay, so how does it relate to this? Circle this term convergent evolution and tie it to homoplasy. It's a cause, basically one of the ways that you can explain why two organisms would have similar features but not have those similar features due to a common ancestor. Instead, convergent evolution uh, is basically independent evolution of similar traits due to adaptation to similar environments and lifestyles, but not due to a common ancestor. It's simply that, let's say in the case of these guys, dolphins and ichthyosaurs, they didn't have a common ancestor that looked like them, that had the same features that they have, but through time they developed these similar structures by having to adapt in the similar environments, similar habitats and lifestyles. Okay, so that's convergent evolution. When organisms share similar features, that are not from evolving from the same common ancestor. Instead, it's from evolving in similar environments and lifestyles, okay? Now keep in mind species, even, even these two guys here, the dolphin and the ichthyosaur, they have so many traits and characteristics that some of those traits may be homologous and others may be convergent within the same animals. Okay, so it's always, you know, it doesn't mean that every trait has to be homologous, homologous or every trait has to, to represent homoplasy. Okay, you can, you can have some or the other. And on this slide, I want you to, um, to, to write that here, this figure here, represents homology, okay? Two organisms having similar traits because they had a common ancestor with those similar traits. Okay, that's homology is this figure. Then this figure over here with dolphins and the ichthyosaur, that you should write under or above it is homoplasy, okay? Two organisms having similar traits but not with a common ancestor having those traits. Instead, they developed independently. Now, how can we distinguish what's homology and what's homoplasy or convergent evolution? The way we do that is with phylogenetic evidence. Okay, so like the phylogenetic trees, the evolutionary um, comparisons, you know, did they have shared evolutionary history? The second way is structural evidence by studying, you know, the structures themselves, the similar structures. And the third way is genetic or developmental evidence. So looking at their gene sequences. Now we're not going to go into the details of all of these. I just want you to know that those are the three ways that you can distinguish between homology and homoplasy, which you can also write as convergent evolution, okay? Don't worry if you didn't catch how to write those down. I'm going to give you a recap slide right now so that you have the spelling of all three of those ways to distinguish homology versus homoplasy. So as promised, here is your recap transcript of some of the key points I just said in the previous slide to help you write them down and especially make sure you're able to write this bullet point down uh, so that you have all three of those ways that I just mentioned.
Now, in addition to these phylo phylogenetic trees, there's also some other even more fun ways to study the history of all of the organisms or species that have existed throughout time. Now, we've mentioned some of the terminology you see here, okay? Um, in order to study the history of organisms, fossils and the fossil record come in handy. A fossil is simply any physical remains, okay, or any physical trace of an organism that has existed in the past. The fossil record then is the total or complete collection of all fossils that we have found around the world so far. And we relate this or we compare this to the sedimentary rock and the ge geological timeline that we have for things. Okay, so you've seen that information before. Now the new information I want to show you are the types of fossils. Okay, so I want you to circle star highlight each type of fossil. There are intact fossils, there are compression fossils, cast fossils, permineolized, and trace fossils. And what I want you to be able to do is if I describe a certain fossil, well, what type of fossil would it be? Well, for instance, you notice here intact fossils are basically physical remnants of an organism that existed that have not decomposed. So intact fossils have organic material and lack any decomposition yet, okay? Compression fossils Okay, that's when you have sediments accumulating on top. So even as you can see in this, this tree or plant leaf, you have all of those sediments accumulating and basically the, the, um, the organic material gets compressed with the sediments. So you get a mixture kind of, of flattened organic material with uh, sediment mixed in. Then you have cast fossils, okay? Underline the term decompose. So notice if you, if you have a question asked of you and the physical remains have not decomposed, okay? That's intact. If the physical remains have decomposed and instead the hole that they left behind gets filled with minerals that then look like a cast of the organism, that is a cast fossil. So look for that word decompose and minerals replaced the, the physical remains. There's also permineolized fo fossils where decomposition is extremely slow. And so basically minerals gradually um, mix in with the, the, the cells of the, the, the remains and you end up with this hardened stone formed. And then last is the trace fossils. I want you to underline indirect evidence of an organism. So instead of having the physical remains of the organism that itself, such as bone or a leaf of a plant or a shell, instead you have indirect evidence indirect physical evidence of that organism like footprints okay, or even their pellets of feces. Okay, so it's not, it's not a piece of the organism, but it lets you learn about what that organism looked like or might have acted like based on the marks that it left behind. Okay, so again, I could ask you, for instance, what if you find preserved bones that never decomposed? What type of fossil is it? Again, if it never decomposed and you have organic fossil, then that's intact. Um, I could ask you, what if the bones did decompose and instead minerals filled the bone-shaped hole they left behind? Well, what one would that be? Okay, that would be a cast fossil. So basically pay close attention. Did the physical remains decompose? Did they not? Are they direct evidence, you know, parts of the organism or is it indirect? 
and just something like a footprint. Okay, what, what type of fossil would that be? Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with that because that is nice, easy way for me to ask questions on an exam. Now, as great and as cool as the fossil record is, I want you to realize that it is not perfect. You know, if you think about it, you're, you're not going to be able to travel back in time right now. Hopefully one day in the future we can. But uh, you won't be able to, you know, see video recordings of things like the dinosaurs and everything. So you're trusting what you find out there in the dirt, in the rock, and things happen. So, you know, there are limitations to the fossil record. The four I want you to know are the fact of habitat bias, taxonomic or tissue bias, temporal bias, which means time, and abundance bias. And so going through each of these, first off, you have habitat bias. Now, like I just said, you are trusting fossils or remains that are buried in dirt and rock. And think about it, you know, each habitat differs in terms of the exposure of these sediments of these, these rocks, you know, so certain areas may form better fossils and preserve organisms better, whereas other areas may, you know, be, be dry or, or too tumultuous, like, you know, tons of of water rushing and flowing and, and smashing up against everything that the organisms don't get to decompose or get buried, you know, comfortably, safely, their remains. So you have to, you know, realize that not every habitat is going to be perfectly represented in the fossil record. There's also taxonomic and tissue bias because, you know, not every part of an organism will fossilize as well. So not every part of an organism is ever gonna leave evidence that that body part or that that structure existed. Because, you know, think about it, some tissues, they, they decay and you, you never get to see a remnant of them, okay? Organisms with bones and shells, now those preserve fairly well and those stand the test of time better. So you'll get plenty of fossils of those, but soft bodied things like, you know, even worm parts, you're not going to get a true representation of all of those soft bodied organisms that existed, okay? There's also that issue in terms of different tissues, not just in animals and organisms like that, that you can picture, even things like plants and flowers, for instance, pollen grains, their, you know, pieces of pollen of a, of a flower or plant, their tough outer shell or outer coating helps them resist decay and kind of fossilize much more intact than, let's say, if you've ever seen a flower start to decompose and, and kind of, you know, get blown away in the wind. So you have to take into account that not every structure will ever be represented. Then there's temporal bias, which is the idea of time. And the idea of time, you know, limits our, our fossil record because think about it. The older a fossil is, especially if you look even at this figure, where are the oldest fossils or rocks? They're deepest in the ground. They're, they're the furthest layers from us. And if you think about it, they have been exposed to a whole lot of destructive forces, okay? They, they've really gone through a lot. So, you know, with that kind of pressure and that, that kind of um, location and, and that longer amount of time being exposed to the environment, you know, you're not always going to be able to trust that you, you know, every organism that lived at that time actually left fossils behind. The last part is the abundance bias. And abundance simply means, you know, how many of something there is. So that's basically saying that the fossil record will be biased in the sense that the more common a species is, the more likely you are to find their fossils.
okay? If you're, you know, searching all of the world and every bit of dirt and rock and there's a rare species, your chances of actually finding it are going to be pretty low, okay? So that's what we mean by each of these different limitations. Now I threw in this slide with the pretty pictures from your textbook just to show you a sample of how fossil records allow scientists to build these massive timelines. Okay, and I want you to notice that the highest top here of a fossil record or a timeline of the history of organisms will represent the present time and the time most close to where we are living now. The deeper down you go, that's further back in time. And as you can see, this one's based on millions of years. So this goes further and further and further back in time. And I put these red marks here so that you'd see this piece here is zoomed in to show you this little portion of this massive timeline. And I want you to note that when you look at the fossil records and the different organisms represented, the bottom of the fossil record that you're looking at, that's where the deepest, oldest fossils are going to be, okay? Just like me. Deepest, the, the oldest fossils will be down at the bottom, okay? And like I just mentioned, due to the high pressure and years of wear, these are going to be the most damaged, okay? Also just like me. So the fossils up top will be more recent. They will be in the better condition in most cases, and the ones down below, those are older and in more worn condition a lot of times. Now, when we talk about studying the history of life, aka the fossil records, there are two most compelling events that these researchers love to study with regard to the history of life. They are one, periods when organisms originate or diversify very rapidly. And the second is when you have periods of time where suddenly um, organisms go extinct rapidly. Okay, so the creation or evolution of a bunch of organisms rapidly and the extinction of a bunch of organisms rapidly. Those are the two um, very compelling events to study. Now, when we are studying the history of life and looking at various phylogenetic trees, one of the things you'll sometimes encounter is an event called adaptive radiation. And the way you can tell this has happened on a phylogenetic tree, before I tell you what it actually is, is you'll notice that there'll be a node with a common ancestor, and then boom, all of a sudden, there's a ton of extra branches. Instead of that common ancestor, let's say, branching off into two that then branch off into two and two more, all of a sudden, you see this common ancestor, you have it branching off into four, and then that branches off into another four right away, and another three, and you end up with a whole bunch of extra branches, you know, kind of showing that you had a bunch of evolution in a smaller period of time. And what adaptive radiation actually is uh, kind of defined as is having that single lineage rapidly producing many descendant species with a wide range of adapted forms in a shorter period of time. Okay, so when you have a burst of new descendants, you can think of it as a burst of new descendant species in a short period of time, that is adaptive radiation. And like I said, we can spot it on a phylogenetic tree when all of a sudden you see a common ancestor branching into multiple branches instead of two, and then multiple again and again. So you end up with a whole, look at all of these branches and descendants, rather than this branch where you only have a few usual descendants. Now, in addition to knowing what adaptive radiation is and how you would spot it on a phylogenetic tree, I want you to know the big example of adaptive radiation, and that is 
the Cambrian explosion. Just picture this picture. Boom, explosion. Now, the Cambrian explosion, like I said, is an example of adaptive radiation. And what it actually was is for the longest time on Earth, for like three billion years, Earth was basically inhabited by all life forms that were just unicellular. Then about 530 to 570 million years ago, most of the major phyla, meaning most of the major organisms that we know today or throughout history emerged in a short period of time, okay, during that specific Cambrian era, okay, between 530 and 570 million years ago. Some people even call it the evolutionary burst of life, because like I said, you know, this is one of the most important examples of adaptive radiation around, where you went from having all of these regular old normal unicellular organisms to boom, one short burst of time, which I know, you know, 530 to 570 million years ago, you know, a span of 40 million years sounds like a long time, but in, in the big picture of the earth, that's not that much of a, a time range. That's a small period of time. All of a sudden you went from having all of these unicellular organisms to most of the phylum, most of the species that we know today or throughout our fossil record. Okay, so that's a pretty big deal. The Cambrian explosion, make sure you know what that means and what it's an example of. So again, what it means is we went from unicellular organisms to boom, all of a sudden, most of the major phyla, plural of phylum, emerged in a short period of time. And it is an example of adaptive radiation. Now, when you hear that, that there was suddenly this burst of all of these new organisms, you might ask yourself, well, how did that happen? Like, what caused there to suddenly be able, you know, to have all of these new creatures around? How did it happen? So researchers came up with four hypotheses to kind of try and explain how you ended up with that adaptive radiation and all of those new species. The first hypothesis that you see here is higher oxygen levels. So higher oxygen levels is also what you see in this figure. Okay, oxygen went from, atmospheric oxygen went from barely existent to a whole lot higher. So uh, basically, you'll usually read it as it went up to at least 10% during the Cambrian explosion. And then it even continued rising after that, because if you think about it, a lot of organisms that then were created uh, ended up producing oxygen or releasing more oxygen into the atmosphere. Now, having higher oxygen levels around basically means if there's more oxygen, that now supports larger, newer body systems. So that's why that's one of the, the things that could have led to having so many more organisms during the Cambrian explosion. There's also the evolution of predation, meaning that when you think about predators and prey, predation drives evolution, okay? Because if you think back to when we talked about natural selection, for instance, when you have predators changing, prey changing throughout time, you basically have certain traits that emerge as being better to, to deal with certain predators, to avoid predators, to become better predators. So you end up with more variety, which leads to more species and more creatures. You also have the hypothesis of new niches because new niches lead to more new niches. Basically, that's a fancy way of saying that when there are new niches around in the habitat, then organisms can exploit these new resources as they venture to new locations. So you, you get creatures, you know, taking on new roles in the habitat, kind of, you know, ex being exposed to new things, and that leads to new species as well. Then we have my personal favorite as a geneticist, new genes. 
And as you know, genes ultimately code for what your bodies look like, what your phenotypes are. So new genes means new bodies, okay? You end up having gene mutations that change things, that accumulate and create new structures, and you end up with new organisms or new species. So any of these or all of these could have contributed to the Cambrian explosion that was observed. Now, unfortunately, when we talk about life, you also must talk about death, okay? Anything that has life eventually has death. So that brings us to the term extinctions. And as you know, extinction means these are organisms that no longer exist, okay? So sometimes we'll find things in the fossil record that you know show us new organisms, but that we can never actually see living because they went extinct. Now, there are two terms related to extinction I want you to know. Mass extinction versus background extinction. And it's kind of like their name suggests. So a mass extinction is when there's the rapid extinction of a large number of organisms around the world. Most of the time, they, spe they specify that a mass extinction occurs when at least 60, that's 60 percent of the species present are wiped out within 1 million years. So I want you to write down that particular threshold. So I'm going to grab the pen and make note that that was at least 60, at least 60 percent of the species present are wiped out within, so within, one million years. So that's one million years, okay? And that is a one in case it doesn't look like that, <laughs> okay? So 60% of species within one million years, that classifies the event as a mass extinction that's different from background extinctions when you have a lower average rate of extinction observed, okay? So that's all the rest of the time. When you have a few species here and there going extinct, that's background extinction, different from the mass extinction events. Now, when I ask how many big mass extinctions have there been and what will most likely be the cause of the next one? The first answer is so far, scientists have labeled five, five big mass extinction events. But some scientists are now saying that we are most likely currently right smack in the middle of the next one, which would become eventually the sixth one. Right now there have just been five, but we're heading toward the next one. And they think that the cause of that unfortunately, will be us, mankind, humans. Okay, so that last question, what will most likely be the cause of the next one? The answer is us, mankind, humans, because of the impact that humans are having on the planet and the various ecosystems and forms of life. Okay, so we're going to be the bad guys when it comes to the next mass extinction, unfortunately. And that is it for today. You have made it through this history of life. Please contact me in the Remind app if you have any questions or are unsure about any of the topics we talked about today. Whenever you're asking a question, please send me a picture of the exact slide that's giving you trouble and never hesitate to send me a list of questions. If you number them, I will get right back to you in numbered order as well. Thank you and have a great day.